Hi guys, Mr. Pulley here for uh, Fieldcrest Western Civilization History Thereof, looking at chapters 19 and 20, uh, Industrialism and Nationalism, and the uh, how those two things are going to affect things later on down the road, getting a little set up here, and then Mass Society caused by some of these new inventions and Democracy. And we're going to see here really is a struggle between new ideas versus old ideas. And we're going to look at two sort of areas in this video, I'm going to do another one after this, uh, one entitled Politics and the Encounter and the other one is dealing with new ideas, uh, sort of social thinking kind of ideas and the reactions to those ideas. So moving on here, starting with uh, politics and the economy, let's look at some new political ideas that develop here. First of which is liberalism, which we've been talking about. And this is, think back to those enlightenment kind of ideas. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. But then also the other is sort of reaction to that going back to the basics, uh, how things were, so to speak, before liberalism. We call that conservatism. Okay. Liberalism, this is that based on those enlightenment ideas. We are free from constraints of the government. Uh, life, liberty, property, and the government should protect those rights, not in any way infringe upon those. And sort of liberal ideas that are going to develop this time period are things like abolition, freeing of the slaves, okay, emancipation, emancipation uh, or excuse me, abolition, ending slavery, emancipation, freeing of a group of people like slaves or peasants in Russia, for example, and the ideas of a plebiscite. We have a popular vote where everyone gets to vote to decide something, uh, whether it be uh, a, a new law or who gets to be the ruler, uh, whatever it is. Uh, in the case of Puerto Rico, whether they become a state or not, they use the term plebiscite all the time. Okay? Conservatism, however, looks at tradition and stability. This is a reaction to the, sort of the liberal chaos, especially caused by the uh, French Revolution and all the damage and wars caused by it. Uh, this idea of returning to tradition and stability means returning to legitimate monarchs, think the uh, Congress of Vienna uh, and those sorts of things, and, and trying to set up uh, these rulers again with absolute rulers to bring back stability to the everything in life. Okay? However, even the liberals aren't as liberal as me we might consider today because even these guys don't want everyone to vote. Why? They only want middle class landowner and males uh, to be able to vote uh, because they don't want everyone to vote. They feel that these uneducated people will lead to sort of a mob rule and they're definitely not in favor of that. Okay, let's turn now to some economic ideas, some new ones in here. Uh, we've got cottage industries versus, the, that's the old system, versus what is the new system, industrial capitalism. Now, both of these sort of are built on that idea of mercantilism, that uh, a country's wealth is based upon its, a uh, country's power, rather, is based upon its wealth, and trying to accumulate wealth in order to have more and more power. Now, cottage industry is production that is done at home. Uh, this was traditionally like the woolen industry in, in England and in northern Germany, uh, the in Ireland. Uh, um, production of cotton for clothing, uh, spinning and weaving was all done at home. That was sort of cottage industry sort of work. Okay? Industrial capitalism is very different. This is an economy based on manufacturing. This is the factory system. Uh, and we're moving production from out of the home and into these factories where we can do it on a larger scale and have more control over it. Now this requires, however, capital. And capital is this um, money, this wealth that is able to be invested in these factories and these things. Without capital, you can't get this done. Okay. Now, Great Britain is able to become the first country to um, go through the Industrial Revolution, and they're able to do it for several reasons. First of all, they've got a great big labor pool. We have farmers, okay? But if those farmers are needed for manual labor on the farm, it requires some new inventions to replace them as labor, okay? And so now these guys come to the cities just in time to re become labor for our new factories. It requires, again, we said capital, this idea of being able to invest in that, and natural resources. In Britain's case, it's gonna be coal and iron, and of course, they've also got some rivers help. Now, rivers, of course, are our power source, our water power source, early on for our earliest textile factories. Uh, but they're not just a source of power, they're also a means of transportation. And England has extensive river and canal system to help move its goods within its own territories. Now, also out of this, however, that factory system has a problem relying, relying on water power, so we're going to see the development of the steam engine, okay? And it's James Watt who doesn't really invent the steam engine. They've been around actually for centuries. What he invents is an improved, reliable steam engine that's able to do work. This allows factories to be moved to the urban areas where the people are 
so we don't have to build housing and stuff for them and move them out to where the factory is at the water place. Okay? So now that we've looked at politics and the economy, let's look at some new ideas in this area. Okay, Starting first off with romanticism. Romanticism stressed that idea of feelings and emotions and imagination. Uh, this is a reaction to those enlightenment ideas and everybody trying to quantify everything mathematically and science-based uh, ideas. It's a lot like uh, outgrowth of Rousseau's ideas that we need to rely on our emotions and feelings somewhat. They see this as, as sources of knowing, all of these things, not just science, but all the feelings, emotions, and imagination are sources of knowing. And again, this is a reaction to science and, and all those things. How romantic? We can even try and make war look romantic. How glorious is that? <clears throat> then, of course, there is realism, which becomes sort of a reaction to the reaction that was romanticism. And realism is kind of saying, hey, we reject romanticism. Look around, guys. This is not what life is like, okay? They're portraying life as it was, okay? Uh, example of this from your book, we've got uh, the painting by Gustave Colbert, Corbet, excuse me, and Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens, of course, uh, author of several novels, The Christmas Carol, and I've got here A Tale of Two Cities. And if you've forgotten that painting by uh, Colbert, that is The Stone Breakers. And so in this time, things we started to see a movement of also developed a new uh, philosophy, so to speak, of uh, secularism. And in secularism, this is an indifference to or a rejection of religion. Now, this is not exactly, uh, this is kind of going beyond some folks who kind of say, hey, I, I believe in a, a God, but uh, some of the stuff you guys are saying aren't exactly true. These guys are kind of saying, eh, religion, I don't need it, or really I'm rejecting it completely because you guys are so out of touch with what I see around me. Uh, example, the biggest uh, name behind this is not really his idea, but uh, supporting his ideas rather support secularism is Charles Darwin, uh, his famous book on the origin of species by the means of natural selection. Uh, natural selection, of course, we talk about as being the theory of evolution. Uh, this should be organic evolution, as he calls it, uh, that plants and animals have evolved over time. Okay, quick break here. I made a mistake on the study guide. I got in chapter 19, I think your last term uh, is listed as being modernism. That's technically in chapter 20, and that's okay. I can talk about it now, but really that term should be organic evolution. So instead of modernism, it should be organic evolution. Plants and animals have evolved over time. We'll go over that a little bit more in class. I'll send a new revised study guide out. Uh, if you've got it, just correct the one you've got on there. Okay, let's move on. Let's look now finally at uh, modernism here that develops. This is a movement that is uh, rebelling against these ideas of traditional literary types of things. Um, these are authors like James Joyce, Ernest Hemingway, T.S. Eliot, F. Scott Fitzgerald. It's a, a movement that lasts for a long time period. And don't forget Franz Kafka there as well. Uh, lots of, of things going on here. But it's also reflected in artistic styles and probably the most famous modernist painter uh, is the guy who painted this that of course is Pablo Picasso Damsel's de Amignon uh, better known in English as the bathers shocked the world including other artists of the time period okay I'm going to stop there and call this the end of part one don't want to make these videos too long I'll be back with the rest of part 19 and kind of blending it right into to 20 that's why I put the two chapters together because they blend together so well See you soon.